For those interested in requesting any type of videos, topics, reactions, commentaries, what have you, feel free to send it either directly to my PayPal or join my Patreon. Both links are down below in the info box. And this is a paid request from Galermo. Thank you so much for that and for your generosity. I really appreciate it, man. And this time he wanted me to talk about 52577, which I thought this sounded familiar, and that's because this is a film I've heard in the making for a long, long time. I remember years and years and years ago, might have been Ain't a Cool News. Remember when that used to be a big thing? I mean, it's still around, but no one gives a rat's ass about it. But they would have stories on there about it. And that's because the director who wrote it, Patrick Reed Johnson, I knew that name sounded familiar. He's the same guy that directed this film back to the day called Spaced Invaders. Remember with the it's a 90s movie with the Martians and they th hear the Orson Welles War of the Worlds and they think there's an invasion. We're going to join in on the fun. Trying to find out that it was just a play, it was just a fake. So they went there accidentally and they're the only ones there. They're like, oh shit, we need to get the hell out of here. It's very much a kid's film. It's the little girl in it, she was in Tremors. She was also the girl in Jurassic Park. She's one of the stars in it. It's a movie of its time. I do have some fun with it. There's some pretty neat special effects. You have the one Martian sounding like Jack Nicholson. So, you know, it's... Not all the humor works. It's definitely a kid's film, but... I, there's a bit of nostalgia to it for me. He also did Baby's Day Out. Which is an interesting film. I do have some fun with it, actually. Mainly for Joe Mantegna and Joe Petigliano. I mean, they're pretty much being the Three Stooges. If the Three Stooges were evil. Or you just say a bit like Home Alone with Joe Pesci and Daniel Stern. But anyway, Patrick Reed Johnson, this is kind of a story of his life in a way. Because he was a guy who was an effects guy. And as people state, in a way he was the first Star Wars fan. Because like detail in this movie... He got a chance to go up to Hollywood and hang out and look around the special effects of Close Encounters, be among the early industrial light magic, and see an early work print of Star Wars before the film came out months later on May 25th, 1977. Now, he filmed it from 2004 to 2006, but then he had to get funding f to finish the film, to have other ad, you know, post production of the film. So it took him a while to get this film done. I mean, really, if you start 2004 when he started filming, it took like 18 years for this film to finally get out because it was officially released in 2022. Now, I was looking at the film. It's a bit hard to find the film to, to watch. And it's 2 hours and 12 minutes. I'm like, oh my god. It's 2 hours and 12 minutes? Really? Oh god. But I will say, despite some nitpicks here and there, it's a nice, somewhat relatable coming-of-age story. And you tell that, you know, this is a guy telling a bit of his life with maybe some embellishments here and there. So obviously he has a lot of passion for this project, and it shows. Now, the guy who stars in it, John Francis Daly, who plays the young Patrick Reed Johnson, he's a guy that... I recognize the actor. If you've ever seen a film called Waiting with Ryan Reynolds... He's the rookie that gets there and Ryan Reynolds is showing him the ropes and anytime he tries to talk, Ryan Reynolds uh, interrupts him. And then he's a the guy that at the end finally erupts and calls BS on everybody, especially Ryan Reynolds. And Ryan Reynolds is like, oh my god, yeah. no, you gotta stay here, man. That's John Francis Daly. Now he also would be a director. He, direct, he helped direct that awful Vacation reboot. But he also helped direct uh, Game Night, which wasn't, you know, that bad of a movie. 
he helped write Spider-Man Homecoming, and he directed that new, co-directed that new Dungeons and Dragons movie, On Ramon Thieves, which, you know, bombed at the box office. But some people say it was decent. Now, I thought he did a decent job as his kid. It, definite love letter to the 70s. It definitely breathes life to the 70s. Makes you believe that it does take place in this era with the commercials on TV, with the way people are dressed, with the way the environment is, even the way it's shot, uh, like the, the look of it. I could see the relatable factor of someone falling in love with movies and being consumed with that love. And feeling like an outsider. This is before the nerd culture today where, well, of course it's cool to be a nerd. You know, superheroes, Marvel. There was a time where that was frowned upon. You would get beaten up. Uh, to relate a story of my own, I remember when I was in school. And I was never beaten up. But, I'm a big fan of movies, like I am today, and I think it was in middle school, it was when Tremors 2 Aftershots came out, and being such a huge fan of the first film, I'm like, oh my god, they're making a Tremors 2, and at school no one really gave a shit about movies, unless there was like, a, later on a new Adam Sandler film was coming out, but other than that, no one really gave a shit about movies. So it's like, oh, yo, what's this, uh, Tremors 3, Matt? What's this, Tremors 6? Um, but most of them, they were fucking right, because there's, what, seven Tremors films now? But, yeah, a lot, you know. So I can relate to that. And so it relates to him being a little kid and seeing 2001 A Space Odyssey. And the editing in the scene, sometimes the editing is a bit... What's the word I'm looking for? The editing seems a bit too wonky, a bit too schizophrenic at times, and montages. I don't know if it was because of the huge span of how this film needed to get made, from starting to get made to finally it's finished putting out there into the world. But sometimes the editing just seemed to either go on either too long or too fast. And I do think that's one of the issues I have with the film. Like in the scene where it's the theater. Now, to me, it would have been best to focus on the kid as you hear the music from 2001 happening and the ending's about to happen. And you're going to the kids. I thought it was going to, the kid was going to go towards the kid who's entranced. Go towards, towards, towards. And then you would see the star child and the kid's pupil reflected from the big movie screen. Maybe it'd go f forwards and then that'll transition. No, it instead keeps coming to other folks in the theater. This guy falling asleep. This guy going. They'll come back to this. A lady eating her popcorn. And then the same guy going. And then, then a different guy going. I'm like, okay, now you're, the focus is here, you're putting it all over here, put the focus back on here, what are you doing? I don't understand that. Maybe it's to show the, how other folks were either bored, confused, or nonchalant with 2001, but you get that later on when his buddy pretty much says, oh, that's a terrible movie. So you already got that, so I don't know... It took what, what could have been a finely edited through line to showcase this is where he fell in love. This is how he got addicted and hooked. But then it's like this busy work editing with all these other reactions that who gives a rat's ass. It doesn't do anything to see all these other people's reactions. But after that, I still thought it was a pretty sweet story. I just don't think it needed to be over two hours long. Of a guy who's you know, he's making movies with his buddy. And he makes like Jaws 2 before there was a Jaws 2. And a sequel to Planet of the Apes. And a sequel to Duel called Another Duel. 
He makes all these short films. And his mom is played by Colleen Camp, who I like as an actress. She was in Dire with a Vengeance, is where the detectives helping John McClane. Uh, she was in Dame of Death, the Bruce Lee, but you know, Bruce Lee's final film that he didn't finish. Who at times does yell for her son, but she really does care, really does want to help her son follow his dream. His buddy, I'm not sure about the actor who played his buddy. Sometimes he just came off a bit too much of a schmuck. I know there are points he's supposed to be a schmuck, but I don't know. I just thought the buddy was kind of one of the weaker actors in the movie. But I thought the lead guy, it, it was a love letter to making movies. A love letter to a guy that many times his head would be in the clouds and imagining. And I was like that as well. Imagining this, imagining that. So he's driving, but then as he's driving, he's imagining him as a his car flying and him as a toy astronaut and his flights of fancy done with old school uh, cheap effects that have a bit of a charm to them. And like I said, the, the movie does encapsulate the idea of the 70s and a guy being so obsessed with movies and special effects in particular. Making films at home, like he made a, a Jaws sequel in a swimming pool and his mom's mad because the pool all looks bloody. And then the circuit breaker breaks. They say, well, circuit breakers are made for breaking. But it never gets into heavy drama with the family. Which is nice. But like I said, it is a coming of age because there's one girl who he likes, but they're they're not really boyfriend girlfriend. And then there's another girl he meets at a cafeteria and falls for. Uh, some of the songs used, like Dreamer, you say you were a dreamer. That's the song I remember from the Rocky and Bullwinkle movie trailer when that came out. That was the first time I heard that song. At least I think because I liked the lead guy, uh, I liked the actor, I liked the story it was portraying, which is a, an apparently a true story, of the writer-director's own experiences, I could relate to him. I could relate to his feelings, his doubts, wanting to not feel alone, people not understanding him but like I said two hours and twelve minutes I think is a bit lengthy for this type of movie sometimes the editing like there's a montage where it goes from he's with his new date and they're going to a theater but then it cuts back to them being back in school then it cuts back to the theater again then it cuts back to this then it cuts back to this then it cuts back to Colleen Camp it just goes on this sort of random no through line with the montage no build up of a montage of consistent time like I couldn't tell you if a day a week a month went by imagine a diagram but then it goes like this and this and then 360 behind and it, <clears throat> I just didn't think it was that effective for what a montage usually portrays in other movies. And I don't even know if you need the montage in that sequence. What the film really does kick in the deer when his mom finally does call this magazine the, the kid reads, American Cinematographer, is able to get him in touch with this editor, played by Austin Pendleton. Uh, Austin Pendleton, if you've seen Short Circuit, he was a guy that would go, Stat! Steve Gutenberg and Fisher Stevens' boss. Uh, he was also in Mr. Nanny as the kid's father who Hulk Hogan is taking care of the kids. 
So I was like, oh, that's cool. It was nice to see him. And I mean, this was done back in 2004, but or around that time. So I don't know what he's doing nowadays. So I don't even know if he's still with us. But it had been a long time since I'd seen him in another film. So it was nice to see him again. And when he gets, like, he imagines this 2001 Space Odyssey scenario when me and the editor. Like in 2001 when the astronaut goes to the unknown and all these images and Petra Reed Johns is trying to recreate the 2001 feel but this is the kids fear of the unknown going into this to meet this editor and what will happen. Will we able to touch the monolith, touch and gain knowledge or gain a higher form. You know, the way this kid's mind creates this situation as he goes on this trip to meet this editor. And then, with this editor, goes behind the scenes of the making of Close Cows the Third Kind, the special effects. And you do have a guy who's playing against Steven Spielberg, which... The guy they got looks like Steven Spielberg, but it looks like Steven Spielberg if he was 15 years old. And sounds nothing like Spielberg. So, I mean, that was a bit weird. And then... Like, the kid freezes up and doesn't really say much. And then he beats someone from Industrial Light Magic, and they're going behind the scenes of the models of Star Wars. There's all the models and the trenches. It was cool seeing all the models of Star Wars, like what it might have been like behind the scenes of making this film. And, oh, yeah, okay, uh, we'll, we'll give you... Just don't talk, tell anybody about this. And he gets to be one of the first people to see the early work print of Star Wars. And that's a montage that then wasn't too bad. It's showing scenes from the film, but it's also showing when, how much you get the rights to show that, of course. That's a tall order because Star Wars being owned by so many what George Lucas will, will allow and then of course what Disney will allow. I was surprised he got anything in it, to be honest. And also Pendleton says, hey, you know what? You go back. This movie you see the first day. And if that doesn't make you want to drive here and start something, then maybe nothing else will. Because he knows, hey, you, you had a chance to talk with Spielberg or hell, say goodbye to him. Nice to be you. You froze up. You're still a dreamer. I can't make you come here. But listen, you see this film on the first day, if it, you decide. You're either going to immediately drive up here and start anew, or something else is going to happen. And that's kind of the thrust of it. Like The day comes, he wants to see this film, but all these things start happening. He gets an argument with his buddy. A uh, friend of his gets something happened to her and has to take her to the hospital he can't get the money to get his car out he loses virginity but then breaks up with the girl or the girl breaks up with him because the girl's like I want to stay here but you you're not gonna stay here so it'd be best if we broke up so just everything on a turmoil for this kid and then he can't even see the film because it opens everywhere but just not here in this shitty small town that he's in and that sense of frustration and like nothing's going right and this one time with the visuals there's a bit where things are just not going well and he's walking around and as he's walking around the background all these heavy effects moments are happening like he's walking by a drive view the scene that made me enjoy the film really enough if, if there's one scene he's walking by like this in the back is a drive and playing the Star Wars old Star Wars trailer and because of his frustration and every turmoil, he's imagining this model falling on the drive through and crashing into everything while behind him while he's walking along. Moments like that maybe like, appreciate, understand what the movie is coming from. And again, maybe also depends on how much you relate to the, the material as well. Until ultimately, he's able to see the film, 
he makes the journey, decides I'm going to fuck him and go, says goodbye to his family, says goodbye to his buddy, and goes off his merry way. Now, is this a film that was worth 18 years in the making? Probably not. But it's nice to see that the guy's passion project was able to finally come out. Finally able to be seen for other people to see it. And Lisa, you see the heart on his shoulder, on his sleeve. Like I said, I don't think it need to be this long of a movie. I think a few of the edits montages, like the opening and the theater and the, the other montage I mentioned, seem a bit too busy work with some of the editing. I don't know how else to put it. Sometimes the bud, I don't know if it's, again, the actor that was cast or just his line readings came off as a bit douchey. So I can't say I really liked the character, although I didn't mind the lead. Some may watch it go, that's it? But, like I say, it was, for a coming-of-age story, for the most part, it was, like I said, a relatable sweet movie that if you're a fan of sci-fi or if, if any part of this you can relate to I think it's worth a watch it's worth at least one watch for anyone and like I say it does a pretty decent job capturing the landscape of the 70s at that point the idea in the way the costumes and the backdrops and idea, even the way it looks Let's say nice to see like the older models and you know the older Star Wars trailer and all those little trinkets there. Some editing could have been done here and there. I do think there's about little snips here and there. You probably could have taken 20 minutes out of this to improve a bit of the pacing, but overall, uh, it was still nice to, to see. It was still they said a decent sweep movie and like I said, like I said Patrick Reed Johnson got his his baby out there although this film came out with little fanfare because I didn't hear anybody talk about this so in a weird way it's kind of a bummer that you know this came out and you didn't really hear anybody talk about them and it's too bad Because like I said, I can't, the, you maybe find some reviews on YouTube, but again, it's not like got any big fervor. I'm not going to say this is a classic and this is an unsung gem, but it's worth at least a, a look or two. If you're at all a Star Wars fan, I'll tell you one thing, it's better Star Wars movie than the Disney trilogy or Rogue One. Because it, it's got a nice heart to it. Like I said, I think John Francis Daly did a good job capturing that awkward, but he's not a complete dork either. He's not a complete... It felt natural. It didn't feel like movie nerd. It didn't feel like a movie nerd. Golly gee, guys. It felt like, oh, just a guy who likes stuff that other people don't, and as he puts in a pretty decent performance in the sequence where one of the things he likes is it you're in a theater and we're all in the same boat in the same realm look at a movie and if it's a movie we enjoy doesn't matter if you're your status you're all in the same collective bubble just enjoying a movie together He does a lot better in the movie than I'm making it sound. So again, like I said, nice to have Colleen Camp and Austin, Pen Austin Pendleton in there. It was cool to see the, the early movies that he did. It has a nice charm to them. Uh, 
his flights of fancy imagination. And I see the creativity involved with that. Overall, yeah. Decent movie. Definitely worth a look. If you look at the trailer, look up the film, if anything about it interests you, give it a look. So with that said, thanks for watching, and we'll see you guys later.